it's interesting that you went down the route of quantum support vector machines because you have uh, written a groundbreaking paper called The Power of Quantum Neural Networks. So, um, and you co-authored that with some amazing people with a top quantum researcher, David Sutter, as well as a Fields Medalist. So this is like a Fields Medal is like the Nobel Prize for Mathematics. And uh, yeah, Alessio Figali um, has a Fields Medal. <laughs> and you co-authored this Power of Quantum Neural Networks paper with uh, David Sutter and Alessio Figali. Um, so um, yeah, it's interesting to me because, and, and there's a funny parallel here where um, today, um, com a conference like NeurIPS, Neural Information Processing Systems, it was created in the 80s to study artificial neural networks, which it, now we typically call deep learning. Um, but through, like, th there was a period of time, um, kind of in the early part of this millennium, in the first decade of this millennium, where even at a conference like NeurIPS, which has neural in the name, everybody was doing support vector machines. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then it was um, like AlexNet, the AlexNet moment in 2012, where Jeff Hinton and his team at University of Toronto showed that uh, deep learning is practical for uh, image recognition at large scales. And that led to this like um, reemergence of neural networks as the leading approach in machine learning and artificial intelligence for a broad range of problems. Not every problem for sure, but you know a lot of the AI advancements in the last decade have been made through uh, deep learning through neural networks. So it's interesting to me <laughs> that you have this expertise in quantum neural networks. Um, and yet it was still, uh, yeah, support vector machines, quantum SVM that you went to, uh, an example of first. Yeah, I think, um, yes. Yeah, so you summarized the, the history of, of machine learning quite beautifully. And I think, um, the reason people like kernel methods or these support vector machines, you know, however you want to call them so, so much is because they're beautiful to study from a theoretical point of view right so here like they're easy to cut well not easy but there are at least a lot of known things that we can say about machine learning from the support vector uh, support vector machine picture um but neural networks as you you know you also mentioned they just work so damn well right so like they just work for everything we throw at them they just can do it they can solve really really complex problems um in almost like a human a human like fashion so you know why and and researchers in, in machine learning have been trying to figure out from a theoretical point of view why but it was mostly the empirical success that drove all the theoretical studies that came afterward right so and and to be honest i think there's still so much we don't know from a theoretical point of view as to why these deep networks work so well um and then you know you might think well why do why do we ignore kernel methods if we can understand them theoretically? But the downside is we can't implement them so well. There's like a cost in training and optimizing these support vector machines um, that scales like something like quadratically in the in the number of um, I think in the in the data. So this is this is quite expensive, and I think neural networks this doesn't have this quadratic scaling. It's it's actually linear, right? So the cost there is is far cheaper. So you can optimize much much larger neural networks with billions of parameters than you can with these these uh, support vector machines. So the reason I mentioned uh, support vector machine as an example now is because on the quantum side, it fits very naturally in a theoretical framework and understanding what you're doing. But whether this will be the thing that we use on a quantum computer or not is still open for debate. And, and my guess is probably not. And, and so then I guess this is a nice natural segue into well, what are, what are these quantum neural networks, right? What, what do these things look like? And are they quite similar to the classical neural networks that we that we know and love and um and what a quantum neural network is you know you can you can kind of understand it in in one sentence is it's basically a quantum circuit which you know consists of certain operations you can think of them as matrix operations but these operations are parameterized so they depend on parameters and just like normal machine learning you need to figure out how to tweak and train and optimize these parameters to fit your data so quantum neural networks are these parameterized circuits where now we have to like figure out how to optimize these parameters for 
for our machine learning task. And so the reason we considered these class of models in this paper that you, you mentioned, this power of um, quantum neural networks paper, is because we wanted to see if they can do anything interesting. Um, you know, do they offer us anything different over traditional classical neural networks? So this is what we tried to, to investigate here. Yeah, super interesting. So it sounds like where we could be with quantum neural networks today is that unlike the quantum SVM example, um, there we may not have yet identified. Um, well, actually, I mean, you tell me. I don't, I don't know why I'm. It like is there. It, so it sounds like with QSVMs, we have a clear we have clear instances of situations, even if the data are not likely to be come across in the real world. We have examples of QSVMs being more efficient uh, than classical SVMs. Is it the case that we're not quite there with quantum neural networks yet? Or, um, yeah, it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're on the, the complete right way to think about it, right? Because um, how did we get there classically? Well, we have computers that we can, you know, do interesting, fascinating things with. We can, like... We, thanks to things like backpropagation, we can scale up neural networks to billions and trillions of parameters now where we can we can train and optimize very large models at scale. Um, but on the quantum side, we can't do this yet, right? So in fact, a lot of um, the research that I did while I was um, a student researcher at Google was really trying to see if we can get backpropagation scaling of resources on these quantum computers. Um, and it's really tricky because of this problem that in information is so delicate on a quantum computer, right? So, so we can't really say we have, you know, this notion of what our next best quantum model is going to be, our sort of quantum neural network, um, which is, I'm using it a little bit differently now because, you know, people use this term for parameterized models, but will it be the next, you know, best neural network? Um, probably not, but we can't really run any impressive empirical studies yet because our computers are still our quantum computers are still so small so um so yeah so it's unfortunate that we can't replicate the same sort of classical machine learning success with just try and see experiments so we have to try and you know like maybe analyze things a little bit more carefully from a theoretical point of view because this is the only option we have right now right 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 so the work that you've done so things like your power of quantum neural networks paper they are like theoretical machine learning more than uh, yes, exactly. empirical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what you're saying with a paper like this is as we begin to scale up quantum computers uh, orders of magnitude more from where we are today, from hundreds of qubits to maybe uh, millions of qubits or something, at that kind of scale, then we will be able to do uh, quantum neural net we will be able to solve quantum neural networks we'll be able to parameter we'll be able to you know yeah find optimal parameters with a quantum neural network and um, these kinds of advantages will emerge then well i hope so but we might still encounter some some barriers right so for example you know going to these large scales where we have billions of parameters is essential for quantum machine learning to be able to compete with with you know large language models and things like this, right? So we have to be able to scale our quantum machine learning models up, but we're going to have to be able to train them, right, um, as efficiently as we can train neural networks. And this is where this idea of like backpropagation comes in. Can we replicate backpropagation? Which you know I'm sure most people listening here know that backpropagation is a recipe to compute gradients in a very efficient way of these super large neural networks. And this allows us, this gradient information allows us to go back to our neural network and change our parameters so that we get a better function, like we get a better a fit to our data. But on a quantum computer, backpropagation is not so easy because how do we kind of reuse information to like compute gradients efficiently? We can't really peek into our circuit at different points and like you know, extract information because as soon as we do, our information collapses, we lose it. So um, so we're going to encounter some barriers when we scale up our quantum models and we need to figure out a better way to optimize them and train them. And backpropagation scaling or like, you know, resources that replicate backpropagation 
is really hard to do. And so something we we showed recently is that um, is that uh, backpropagation scaling is pretty much impossible uh, to achieve unless you have uh, something called quantum memory available to you. And um, and this is also something you know maybe if if you're interested we can we can dive a little bit more into. But um, all I want to say is that yeah there there are some like actual barriers there that even if we have huge quantum computers it's not so straightforward that we'll be able to like optimize them in the ways we can optimize neural networks. Yeah.